Good morning, everybody, and welcome to worship here at Trinity St. Andrews. Special welcome to all visitors and guests who are joining us, either online or in person. It's a delight to be able to share this day with you. Uh, today is a special uh, Communion Sunday service. Uh, it's the feast day of St. Mary Magdalene. It's probably the least celebrated saint's day in the whole calendar. She is the unforgiven saint. But none of us would be here without her, because she is the apostle to the apostles. It was St. Mary Magdalene who broke the news of the resurrection to the rest of the guys of the disciples. So we're celebrating that a woman's word is worth listening to, everybody. I think that's an important thing to have. So uh, in terms of announcements, uh, there's actually very little on, on, the, on the, uh, we have still looking for volunteers for the sign up for coffee time uh, in the coming weeks, and anyone is welcome to uh, help out with that. Uh, does anyone else have any announcements to share? Dana. Just a reminder that our Music to Memories uh, Dementia Sing Along is on August the 1st, upstairs at 11 a.m. There is no coffee club. Uh, for the Dementia Society over the summer, but we are still meeting on Thursday, August 1st at 11 in the chapel. So let us begin our worship as we light our Christ candle. We light our candle as a sign of God's spirit that is still at work in the world. May its light brighten our spirits and may the light of God shine through us to brighten our world. God calls us this day to a life of joy. With God, joy cracks through the bonds of despair, like a dandelion cracking through the pavement. With Christ, joy gilds the edges of even ordinary days as we gather with friends and family on a summer picnic. And with the Holy Spirit, joy bursts forth in moments of quiet pleasure, like the call of a loon on a clear moonlit night. This is the day which our God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Our opening hymn this morning is number 41 in your More Voices book, O oh, Beautiful Gaia, number 41 in your More Voices book. <laughs>
Let us join our hearts in a word of prayer. Loving God, you're the maker of heaven and earth, and the morning breezes whisper your holy name. The trees clap their hands in time with creation's songs of joy. You build your beloved community in our midst, despite our best efforts to often tear it down. Your simple gift of peace is of more value than all the world promises us. And Jesus Christ, you are the teacher of our hearts. You walk with us through streets of fear and failure, holding our hand so we have no need to be tempted by the evil one. You give us words to speak when the worries of our lives often leaves us speechless. And spirit of grace and hope, your river of mercy tumbles through us, washing our hearts of all we cannot release, so we may be reconciled with all who have hurt us. Your peace, O God, defends the weak. Your glory shines in the oppressed, for your justice embraces all people. God and community, holy in one, one in three, we lift our hearts to you as we gather for worship this day. Amen. Uh, in the announcements, I did neglect to mention the congregation has learned with the passing of Jack DeShane. Uh, his funeral service will be here tomorrow morning at 11 a.m., and the reception is to be at the curling club afterwards, and we do hope you'll be able to attend uh, that service. Call on Roy Vassi for the sharing of our scripture readings for today. Good morning. Uh, the first scripture is from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 to 14a. King David was settled in his safe palace, and the Lord kept him safe from all his enemies. The king said to the prophet Nathan, Here I am, living in a house built of cedar, but God's covenant box is kept in a tent. Nathan answered, Do whatever you have in mind, because the Lord is with you. But that night the Lord said to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David that I say to him, You are not the one to build a temple for me to live in. From the time I rescued the people of Israel from Egypt until now, I have never lived in a temple. I have traveled around living in a tent. In all my traveling with the people of Israel, I never asked any of the leaders that I appointed why they had not built me a temple made of cedar. So tell my servant David that I, the Lord Almighty, say to him, I took you from looking after sheep in the fields and made you the ruler of my people Israel. I have been with you whenever, wherever you have gone, and I have released, defeated all your enemies as you advanced. I will make you as famous as the greatest leaders in the world. I have chosen a place for my people Israel, and I have settled them there where they will live without being oppressed by anyone anymore. Ever since they entered this land, they have been attacked by violent people, but this will not happen again. I promise to keep you safe from all your enemies and to give you de descendants. When you die and are buried with your ancestors, I will make one of your sons king and will keep his kingdom strong. He will be the one to build a temple for me and I will make sure that his dynasty continues forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. That is, thus, thus ends the first scripture. The uh, gospel reading, oh, stand as you're able, please. The, the gospel reading is taken from Mark 6, verses 30 to 34 and 53 to 56. The apostles returned and met with Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. There were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his disciples didn't even have time to eat. So he said to them, let us go off by ourselves to some place where we will be alone and you can rest, as, uh, rest a while. So they started out in a boat by themselves to a lonely place. Many people, however, saw them leave and knew at once who they were. So they went from all towns and ran ahead by land and arrived at the place ahead of Jesus and his disciples. When Jesus got out of the boat, he saw this large crowd, and his heart was filled with pity for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. They crossed the lake and came to land at Gennesaret, where they tied up the boat. 
As they left the boat, people recognized Jesus at once. So they ran throughout the whole region, and wherever they heard he was, they brought him the sick lying on their mats. And everywhere Jesus went, to villages, towns, or farms, people would take their sick to the marketplaces and beg him to let the sick at least touch his cloak. And all who touched it were made well. So ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is 574 in Voices United. Come, let us sing of a wonderful love. Number 574. So how is your summer going? Has it been a good one so far? A little bit of rain, right? But have you had lots of rest and relaxation? Sounds good. I'm hoping you had time to gather with friends and family, maybe even a barbecue or a reunion or two. It's always amazing. In Canada, everything stops for two months of the year. Our social year runs from September to June, and then Everything stops for two months because we all want to get out and enjoy these warm days of summer. It's good to be able to have a rest, isn't it? Even Jesus recognizes the need for a day off, which I find amazing. This morning we heard how Jesus and his disciples have been so busy sharing the good news, they haven't even had time to sit down and have a bite to eat. So Jesus tells his disciples that they should come away with him and have some quiet time together. And they all jump at that chance to get in the boat with Jesus and go and have a break. And in that Old Testament lesson, we hear that God even likes camping. God likes hanging out in tents rather than in buildings. You know, if, if God wants to go camping, then I think we should be allowed to go camping too. <laughs> and both of our Jewish and Christian faiths promote this idea that we all need a rest every now and then. In the Ten Commandments, it's very clear. Six days shall you labor, and on the seventh day you shall rest. The Sabbath is the feast day of creation. It's a celebration of the goodness 
of what has been created. The whole work of those first six days of creation was done in order that that seventh day of rest might happen. So God's resting on the seventh day is not an anticlimax or an afterthought. The, world, the work of the world being created was done so that we could experience Sabbath, the joy of being here. And this idea of Sabbath rest was one of the first and most defining beliefs for those Jewish people. They had been slaves who worked seven days a week all year long. To say that you're so important you deserve a day off? That was a big, bold statement. And in the creation story, God's resting on that seventh day is the crowning moment of glory for this new world that has been made. Now, the Ten Commandments, most of them are framed in the negative, of course. You know, they tell us, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. And it's usually good advice that they're telling us to, you know, don't do those bad things. But the longest commandment and the most positive commandment is telling everyone how to keep the Sabbath. It's a universal commandment. Men and women, slaves and frees, both humans and animals, are to observe a Sabbath rest. And every seventh year, even the land is supposed to have a Sabbath rest. That's an important statement, don't you think? That even the land deserves a break? It's, most of those commandments, you think, okay, I shouldn't really do that one, but can I get around doing that one? But with the Sabbath, the language is different. In Jewish theology, they talk about welcoming in the Sabbath. They treat it like it's a welcome guest coming into their homes because it's a gift that we're supposed to enjoy. So what's so important about Sabbath? Well, the truth is we need Sabbath if we really want to experience the joy of what God has created and also what the resurrection is really giving us, which is that gift of life. The Sabbath represents our redemption by God. We're redeemed from having to work all the time. It's the time when God's gifts of grace and love get to be fully experienced and appreciated. To rest on the Sabbath is to give yourself the time you need in order to fully experience God's presence in your life. It's to realize how God is already fully here in creation and in us. And the Sabbath shows how our activities are completed by a time of rest. That's important. Good, work, good to do work, but even better to have a day to sit back and go, this is good, this is good. Because work alone is not the meaning of life. That's an important one. Repeat after me. Work alone is not the meaning of life. Work alone is not the meaning of life. That's a hard lesson to learn, isn't it? It's a hard one to learn. A time of rest, appreciation, relaxation, they are necessary before the meaning of our work can be fully realized and appreciated. To share in this one day of rest a week, each week is to gain a foretaste of what eternal rest and peace can actually feel like. It's a taste of heaven. And to live one day on God's time and not our work o day time. But it is a hard message for us to hear. We live in a culture that values work and productivity above all else. It's been, what, almost 35 years since we've had, you know, Sunday shopping here in Ontario. And my, how our world has changed. Sunday's now the second busiest shopping day of the week. If you work retail, you're working Sunday. We want everything available 24-7. And we've almost forgotten what it's like not to do that. And actually, I discovered, you know, just how different it has become. A couple of years ago, I went to Spain. And I was shocked to see that in Spain, just about everything shuts down on a Sunday. Maybe the tourist districts, you know, they, they stay open. But generally speaking, in the regular villages, everything is closed. The restaurants are open because you want to go out with your family. It's a family day. But the funny thing is, in Spain, it's like Canada. Very few people go to church anymore. So I asked one of the Spaniards I met, so why haven't the laws changed to allow Sunday shopping like everywhere else? And the Spaniard replied that even atheists need a day off. <laughs> hey, for an, even atheists, they want to take a day off. They want a day with their family. Why not? To take a deliberate day of rest says something about our priorities in life. To take a Sabbath rest shows that it's more important to exist than it is to work all the time. The high point of our week should be the appreciation of the goodness of life and not what we produced in that week. It invites us to remember what God has done and is doing 
and what, dream of what God will do in the final redemption of this world. Keeping Sabbath is supposed to bring us heaven here on earth. Excuse me. And that's why Jesus takes his disciples away so they can, on that boat ride, he wants them to experience the joy and rest that the Sabbath brings. Only then are they going to have the energy that they need in order to uh, share the gifts of redemption, healing, and salvation with the world. Even the disciples, no matter how hard they work, cannot solve the world's, world's problems on their own. And none of us can save ourselves in this world just by our hard work. We need to make time for God to be active in our lives and in our world. We need heaven to come down here on earth. And for this reason, our earliest Christian ancestors did observe that Sabbath day of rest on the Saturday. They celebrated the feast day of creation and gave thanks for all that God has done. And then they would continue that celebration into that next morning to Sunday morning because they recognized Sunday as the day of resurrection. Now, you and I would say that Sunday is the first day of the new week. Now, the Jewish phrase for that is on the eighth day. You know, we have a seven-day week. The eighth day is the first day of the new week. But they use that phrase, on the eighth day, because something new is happening on the eighth day. And the Bible says, on the eighth day, Mary Magdalene and the other women went to the tomb. This eighth day pushed Mary Magdalene and those other women into a new beginning, a new creation. They went and shared the word with the male disciples, and they discovered Jesus is risen. And all around us is that reminder of this eighth-day possibility. Even our building here is built on eight. If you take that circular staircase going up to the upper level, that's an octagon. That's an eight-sided stairwell. It's a stairway to heaven. When you get up to the top of the stairs and you go into our sanctuary, the pulpit that I, sit, I preach from is an octagon. The baptismal font that we baptize our children has eight sides as well. And our seating pattern of the pews upstairs, if you were to make it into a 360-degree shape, you would realize we have an octagon-shaped church. Everywhere in this church is the message that we are standing inside the resurrection and that we are here seeking to be reborn. So we do things a little bit differently here as a result. We don't spend our entire life focused on the week that has passed, worrying about what has happened. Instead, we integrate what happened in those seven days because it gets us ready for the eighth day. By God's grace, our past failures are forgiven, and as a result, we learn from our mistakes and our experiences, but we're not defined by what happened. We're forgiven for the things we messed up, and that sets the stage for what happens next. In this sacred space, we are a new creation. We are a new beginning, and we're continually being drawn into what happens next. We're not, what we did in the past does not define us as Christians. I always say it's much more interesting to find out what did a person do after they met Jesus rather than worrying about what were they doing before they met Jesus. St. Mary Magdalene, people accuse her of having been a prostitute. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that, by the way. And we treat her as if she did something wrong. But isn't it much more important to know what did she do after she met Jesus as opposed to what she was doing before she met Jesus? Because that's the real measure of a person. What did you do after you met Jesus? We are defined by what we seek to do next with God. And that's how you see Sabbath time is tied up with resurrection time. Now, I realize in our busy world, it is hard sometimes to find a Sabbath rest. Can we all dare to say, I'm going to put this thing away for an entire day and not listen to it? It's kind of hard. But can we ever be truly healthy or whole if we don't make a conscious effort to actually take some time to rest and appreciate the gift of this life? Now, we may not be able to dedicate a whole day to this, but we all have the ability to create a time for rest, a time for rejuvenation in the cycle of a week. Is there anything more precious than a lazy day of freedom in a tightly scheduled world? And on a summer, beautiful summer's day like today, it can even feel like a gift from God. Now, in our household, my wife and I have come to an agreement. Never apologize for a good nap. <laughs> Never apologize for having a good nap. Naps are good for you physically, emotionally, and spiritually. 
And you should be able to take that nap and not feel guilty. When the prophet Elijah was feeling down and out, God said to Elijah, here, have a nap, have a snack, you'll feel better. Even God is saying, take a rest. So if you can wake up from a nap and going, that was a good nap, I needed that. How much better do you feel? As of going, oh darn, I had a nap, I got so much to do. No, I had a good nap, praise the Lord. And what a beautiful day it is to be able to do that. So you see, my sermon this morning is, I'm not trying to guilt you into making time for God. I'm just saying, have a good nap. Relax. Enjoy it. I'm trying to get us to open our hands and hearts to receive this gift of time that God keeps offering us. With the invitation of the Sabbath, God is making time for us. And so what we're being offered here is time. The gift of a time of freedom, the gift of a time of redemption, the gift of a time of salvation, the gift of a time of healing, the gift of a time of wholeness, a gift of a time of rest. And these gifts are so important that God gives us Jesus, who even says to his disciples, come away with me. Let's have a break. Get in the boat. Go for a ride. Get a meal. Enjoy our time together. He comes to show us in practical ways how these gifts are possible. And that opens the door to what happens next. Resurrection time. The gift of new life opens the door of what we will do next with God on this eighth day as part of this new creation that is continuing to unfold. This today is the gift of an eighth day, which is the promise of God's wondrous future. For this gift, this time, we give our thanks. How are we doing for time here? Okay, let's take five minutes. I want you in your table groups. How do you welcome the gift of Sabbath in your life? How do you take time you need to rest? Just go around, one, one sentence each, just in your tables, please. How, how, how do you take, make that time to rest?
Okay. So I'd like to bring you back, uh, and uh, thank you for the conversation. And uh, we have some special music for you. Uh, Mike Gorman is going to do a solo for us this morning. This song was written by uh, Mark Hall uh, just shortly after getting the phone call from the doctor. And it has a particular significance for me because I discovered the song while recovering from cancer surgery, sitting in a chair in my living room. And uh, it did touch my soul. didn't see coming no one would blame you though if you cried in private if you tried to hide it away so no one knows no one can see if you stop believing oh my soul you are not alone there's a place where fear has to face the god you know one more day he will make a way let him show you how you can lay this down Cause you're not alone Here and now You can be honest I won't try to promise That someday it all works out This is the valley and even now he is breathing on your dry bones and there will be dancing there will be beauty where beauty was harsh and stone this much i know oh my soul you are not alone there's a place where fear has to face the god you know one more day he will make a way let him show you how you can lay this down I'm not strong enough, I can't face any more. And my shipwrecked faith will never get me to shore. Can he find me here? Can he keep me from going under? Oh, my soul, you are not alone. There's a place where fear has to face the God you know. One more day, he will make a way. Let him show you how you can lay this down. Cause you're not alone. Oh, my soul, 
you're not alone. Thank you, Mike. That was quite beautiful and very moving. We give thanks for everyone who shares their gifts and supports our church and our many ministries. Your gifts of support and encouragement do mean a lot. You can get more information about making a donation by contacting the church office or by visiting our website. For all the gifts you share, for the people you bless by your serving and giving as a disciple of Jesus, we give our thanks. Let's sing together our offering song, God is so good. Giving God, we give you thanks and praise for all of your good gifts to us. We know that you're source of every good thing. All light and love come from you. You have created us, and you continue to breathe life into us through the power of your Holy Spirit. You've given us so much. And it's because we recognize these gifts that you have given to us that we now give to the work of your ways, your kingdom, your beloved community. May these gifts be used wisely, that your love may be known widely. As we dedicate this offering, we offer ourselves as well. The gifts of money are but tokens of ourselves. Take us and use us, that our hands, our hearts, and voices may reach out and serve us. Help us to walk the difficult path of reconciliation, so our words may be a way of peace for all. Bless us and bless these gifts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our next hymn in, to set us up for communion is 468, Let Us Talents and Tongues Employ. So on your table, you will notice there is a tray with our communion pods, and we invite you to sort of pass those around to make sure that everyone has one. And for those of you who are watching online, uh, you're invited to get whatever you have uh, that, to make up your own communion elements so that you can share in this feast with us. Now you're going to want your hymn books open to 296, This Is God's Wondrous World. We'll be singing that a verse at a time. That's your part of the communion liturgy. 
So we begin with the call and response that you'll see printed in your order of service. So, the Lord be with you, and also with you. Will you open your hearts to God? Let us give thanks to God. We rejoice and give God our praise. Spirit of wonder and unlimited vision, we praise you for the bounty of the creation that surrounds us and for all the marvels of life that we know. Giver of life, we come in faith and in doubt, open to your love, your truth, and seeking your wholeness. Be with us and hear us as we worship and pray. And gentle one of the earth, whose arms have held children and blessed them, whose eyes have sparkled with laughter and tears, we come yearning to trust in your companionship. Let's sing together the first verse of This is God's Wondrous World. This is God's wondrous world. Truly, we are alive with divinity, we are alive with humanity, and we've all been touched by God's grace. So gracious, eternal creator, we ask, you ask each of us to show our love for you by tending and feeding your world and its people, and we seek to respond to your call to live fully in you. And risen living Christ, you embrace the whole world with a caring mercy that transforms what is possible on each eighth day when we seek to respond to your invitation and change our lives for tomorrow. And Holy Spirit, you go before us. You call us into the future. You energize us to dream new visions, to be open to taking new risks, and to embrace what is unknown. Help us to respond to your invitation, to dream with you as you seek to embrace the whole world. Let's sing together the second verse. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. All who come to me shall not hunger, and all who believe in me shall not thirst. And so with Christians around the world and throughout the centuries, we gather around these symbols of bread and wine, which speak to us of nourishment and transformation. And so loving God, we thank you that you are close to us as our next breath, that your love is constant and unfailing. We thank you for all that sustains life. And especially we thank you for Jesus Christ, who teaches us how to live an ethic of justice and peace. We praise you for this promise of transformation, made manifest in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection. We ask you to bless this cup and this bread. Through this meal, make us the body of Christ, that we may join with you in promoting the well-being of all creation. In the broken bread, may we share in the life of Christ, so we might dedicate ourselves to being his disciples once more. And in the symbol of the cup, may we share in the spirit of grace, so we might help transform this world. So bless us, guide us, be one with us and in us, we pray. Let us sing verse 3.
And so we follow the example given to us by Jesus, who took bread, the food of life, and gave thanks to God for the gift of that life and all that nourishes it. And he broke bread, and taking on the form of the servant, he served it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you, to feed you in body, mind, and spirit. In the same way, at the end of the meal, he took the cup, the cup of blessing, and said, this is my blood poured out for you, a new covenant, a new relationship with God, the Spirit poured out for us all. So I invite you to take your communion pods and start by peeling off on the bread side. And take and eat. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the bread of life to feed us all. I invite you to peel off the grape juice side. The blood of Christ shed for us all, the cup of God's blessing to fill us with the spirit of life. Thanks be to God. Take and drink. We give thanks, dear God, that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of the risen Christ. Strengthen our faith, we pray. Increase our love for one another. Deepen our love. Broaden our compassion. And send us out into the world united in a spirit of peace, that we may be witnesses to the power of your love this day and always. Amen. Our closing hymn is 646, We Are Marching. So go forward into this eighth day in a spirit of joy. Laugh, share the delights that these summer days bring. Be at ease in your struggle. Be bold in your loving. Be joyful in your giving and graceful in your praying. Become a song of God's delight. Shine as bright as the sun. Take a day of rest and enjoy the beauty of this world around you. For God is with you. Go now in peace, my friends. Amen. <laughs>